Hello everyone and welcome back to Lawrence Plays With Cars. So in the last episode, yes, I talked about how I'd um, picked up a new car for myself to replace the, um, the RX-8 given that it was having, some, having a few issues. And well, here it is. I don't know how much of it you can, I don't know whether anyone's going to be able to ident actually identify the car from this shot, but don't worry, I'll let you in on, uh, on what it is in a few moments. But first, let's have a little bit of a sort of, to keep the uh, anticipation going, let's have a quick look back into how I ended up in this car. I went onto Auto Trader and put in a search for convertibles with at least 150 horsepower. That seemed like a good starting point. It ticks two of my boxes that I, that I can easily explain to a computer, since, well, Auto Trader doesn't have a, a no French cars option. <coughs> then I sorted it by price and started to scroll until I found something I didn't hate. There are a few interesting possibilities in there. Lots of Saab 93s, for example, including one that had an adjacent number plate to the one my brother owned a few years ago. They certainly seemed interesting. Sure, they'd be a very different car from what I was really looking for, but it's also interesting to try new things and find out what I like and don't like about them. I carried on scrolling, past the Peugeots and the Vauxhalls, and then found a Mercedes SLK, the 2.0-litre supercharged version from the year 2000. It was pretty cheap, so I thought I'd take a look, so I headed off for a test drive. The car was... OK. Putting the roof down immediately made me unreasonably happy, so I knew I definitely wanted to be looking at convertibles, but the car itself felt underpowered, and, and not just compared to the RX-8. It felt similar to, perhaps slightly slower than the old 1.8-litre MX-5 of the same age that I had a few years back. It was also rather ugly, especially inside. I was expecting really high specs because, well, it's a Mercedes, but the interior seemed dated and cheap. I wasn't a fan. I kept looking, and eventually found an even uglier and even cheaper SLK. I was discussing that with one of my friends, and he pointed out an advert for an SLK 280. It was a bit more expensive, as it was a 2005 model, but, but that meant it wasn't as underpowered, and it was a second generation, which looks much nicer. I went out late one night, took it for a test drive in the dark, and decided to go for it. After a few hassles with the bank's anti-fraud systems, I was driving it home and trying to decide whether I'd made the right decision. And so, here it is, my uh, 2005 Mercedes SLK 280. And the 280 means that it's got the 3 litre V6 that produces about 231 horsepower, or at least did when the car was new. Goodness knows what it's like now, I haven't had it um, dynoed, but it does go, it goes quite nicely, so it's, that's the same amount of power that the RX-8 had. However, one of the big differences is that while the RX-8 was a, was a rotary engine, this is a V6 so, a piston engine. So while the RX-8 was very happy to rev really, really high, it would go up to 10,000 RPM before you hit the red line, uh, it meant that you didn't get all of the power until quite a long way up. The, uh, the torque curve was quite steep. So you get, at low revs, you'd, you'd be driving along, you put your foot down and very little would happen. You, you needed to really get up to about six, 7,000 RPM to really get the power out of it. And that meant that sort of for driving around, or driving on track, it was great because it made loads of noise, it was great fun. But around, sort of, around town and more sort of normal driving, it wasn't quite as good because you, you had to um, really push the engine to get the power out of it. And if you start pushing your engine when you're just doing normal driving, you look a bit, let's just say you look a little bit silly. <laughs> Whereas the V6 in this car seems to have a much, much flatter power delivery. So even at relatively low, um, rev, low in the rev range, um, you can get a decent amount of acceleration out of it. In fact, I've noticed that Whilst it's got it's got six gears on the, in the gearbox, but when you get it, you can do six you can use sixth gear for anything from about 35 miles an hour upwards. So it's got quite a lot of grunt there that is just able to provide even at relatively low speeds, which um, makes it a much more civilized car to drive. So I, I quite like that. Unfortunately, I'm stuck behind a an Kia at the moment, which is going. Well, it, 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 to be fair, it's doing the speed limit, so I'm not, I'm not going to complain too much. <laughs> but, it's, uh, but it means I can't, and then there's other traffic behind me, so I'm not going to play around too, uh, with the car too much. Now, the other really obvious thing you probably noticed from the, uh, from the view here is that it's a convertible. Yes, I'm finally back in a convertible. I've, 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 I really like that in the MX-5, and then while in the time I had the RX-8, yeah, the extra power was fun, the rotary engine and the, and the, and the, sort of the drama of it was good fun, but I missed being able to put the roof down on a nice day, and, and this is a nice enough day. There's nothing falling out of the sky, so I'm pretty happy with this. The problem with this car, though, is because it's a powered roof, it takes ages for the roof to go up and down. It's like 22 seconds from, um, from start to finish. And whilst that's not 
It doesn't sound like a long time. And if you're sat in your driveway and you don't, you're not in really in any great hurry, it's, it's not too bad. It doesn't, it, it honestly, it doesn't matter. But if you're stuck at a red light and there's someone behind you being impatient, it's not so great. And if it starts to rain, definitely not so great. And unfortunately, that's not happened to me yet. But it's, yeah, it's, it's a concern. So the MX-5, three seconds from up to down or down to up. This one, more like 20, 22, 25 seconds. So it's not ideal. And also you can't move the roof when the car's in, uh, moving. However, there is an aftermarket module you can buy called a Smart Top which fixes a couple of these problems. It allows you to, by allowing you to have the roof moving um, when the car is moving slowly, and also to trigger it remotely using the, um, using the key. So I think I'll probably be getting one of those and fitting that. So watch out for that in a later, in a later video. <laughs> but other than that, I mean, it doesn't really matter. The roof goes down. It's one of those where it folds up and it goes into the boot though. So you lose half of your boot space to the, uh, to the roof. But again, I mean, it, has, it hasn't been a problem yet because I've, not been I've generally not been transporting very much stuff around with me. Although there is a boot separator that you have to put across before you can put the roof down. Um, and I've forgotten that once or twice and then got in the car and been able, unable to put the roof down. And, and that's a little bit annoying. But overall, yeah, happy with it. It's great to be back in the convertible again. I can't, I can't, I can't say it enough how much I love these, how much I love top-down motoring. <laughs> now, the other thing about this car is being a Mercedes, it's got lots of the sort of the the higher end features, should we say? And some some of them are some of them are quite nice. Some of them are a little bit silly. So I've got things like heated seats, auto, automatic lights, all those sort of things you'd expect these days. Um, although bear in mind this is a 16-year-old car, so they weren't quite as common back in those days. Um, but it also has uh, some entertaining things like uh, it, it has what they call an air scarf, where it blows warm air on the back of your neck to keep you warm when you're driving when you're driving with the roof down. <laughs> and Actually, it sounds completely gimmicky, but it's actually really quite nice. When you're um, on a cold day, having, a, having a, um, a blast of warm air on the back of your neck, it actually really makes the car quite a lot more civilized. So yeah, I'm a fan of that. It's also got um, motorized seats with memory uh, functions on them. So you can, you can set the seat into the position that you want to have it um, and then uh, save that position. And then even if someone else comes in, he drives your car and messes around with the, um, the seat positioning, you can just put it back and get to, put to where it was by pre at the press of a button. That's quite nice. Um, I've only ever seen that once before, um, and that was on a on a hire car we had out in the states. I say car; it was a, more basically a tank. Um, but it was, yeah, it was it was nice then because we had three of us driving the car. It's nice here because it, um, not that anyone else has driven this car yet, but it's it's nice to have nonetheless. There are a few little things wrong with this car, and these are not from a sort of a an actual technical problem with the uh, with the car as it was made, but just because well, it's it's 16 years old. When I first got it, uh, one of the handbrake shoes had completely disintegrated. So the, the handbrake, let's just say the handbrake didn't really hold the car when you put it on, especially if you were on a steep hill. So I've had that fixed because that was actually sort of, you know, that was a safety issue, so it needed to be dealt with. Um, and it, it wasn't too expensive, but it was, it was something that needed to be done. I'm used to cars with um, disc brakes, but this has apparently has um, drum brakes for the handbrakes, which is a, bit, a little bit weird, but it means when you put the handbrake on, like, so you put the hand, stop, stop the car, put the handbrake on and let off. It rolls back ever so slightly, which is really disconcerting. I'm not a fan of that, <laughs> but I guess I've, I'm, I'm getting used to it gradually as, um, as time goes by. But yeah, not, not convinced. And there it, yeah, it's just, it's not far. It's just a sort of a, a few centimeters, but it's enough that you feel like you haven't put the brakes on properly. There's also a bit of a weird noise coming from the transmission uh, or the, the, um, the drivetrain somewhere, but somewhere sort of back behind the gearbox between there and, and, the, uh, and the drive wheels. So that's going to need to be, I think, going to need to be fixed at some point because it makes a bit of a weird noise when you lift off the throttle. Uh, see if you can hear it. Yeah, not so noticeable there, but at slow speeds and um, when you, when you, especially when it's cold, it's very, very obvious and it's a bit disconcerting. And you know, I, I would, I don't want my car to sound broken. <laughs> Let's put it that way. There's also a rather um, obvious crack in the windscreen, so I'll need to get that fixed at some point. But uh, again, not a, not a huge issue. Um, just something that needs to be sorted at at some point in the future to make the car nice and pretty and everything correct about it, that sort of thing. 
um, oh, and a small dent in the bonnet. But you know, when you pay when you when you pay um, not very much for a and for a 16 year old uh, fairly high end sports car. Well, I say high end, fairly fairly powerful sports car, at least for the UK. Um, you, you you get what you you get what you get, and then and, it may, and it's not going to be perfect. So generally, yeah, generally I'm happy with it. There are just a few little things here and there that need need tweaking to make it that just that little bit better. And I suppose the next thing for me to do is to take it on track day. I haven't got any of those planned at the moment, but I've been talking to my friends, and we're thinking that yeah, sometime early next year, maybe about February or so, will be a good time when um, when when life calms down a little bit. And hopefully the weather's going to be good enough that we won't have an absolutely torrential rain on uh, type track day. We did that once. We went to um, Abingdon um, back when I had the RX-8. And it was, well, it didn't rain the whole day, but it rained hard enough in the morning that they actually closed the track and said, nope, sorry, you're just going to have to wait and wait until the rain stops and, and the weather starts to behave itself. So it's, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's not the ideal conditions. I'd rather not do another one of those. It, and, and the tracks become so much more slippery and you can't go as fast. It's just, it's, it's a different sort of fun, but it's not a fun that's quite as much fun, I think is probably the best way to put it. So yeah, I'm looking forward to um, a much drier track day next time, I hope. Because I haven't done any track days yet, I've not really pushed the car hard. I mean, yeah, I've done a few sort of, I've accelerated hard along um, an on-ramp onto a motorway, that sort of thing, and uh, I've taken the odd roundabout a little bit quickly, but basically I haven't really pushed it yet, so I can't say how, exactly how the car feels. It does feel, it doesn't feel quite as go-karty as I remember the MX-5 being, but then the same was true with the, um, the RX-8 as well, so there's, there's something about the feel of the MX-5 that not even the RX-8 can quite replicate, that I do kind of miss. So I think I am still planning in the future to go back into an MX-5 because there's, just some, there's something about them. They're just, they're just so wonderful that I can't... Um, oh, there's one going past now. Um, I, can't, I, can't quite, I can't quite put my finger on exactly what it is, but the way they feel and the way they make me feel when I'm driving them is just amazing. That said, as I, get, as I drive this car more and get a bit more used to it, I am starting to enjoy it more and more. I'm getting, the, I'm getting the feel for it, I'm getting used to it and, and sort of getting used to what it can do. I'm still not quite used to having to change gear at, what is it, 6,500 RPM after um, being able to change at 10,000. But I think that will that'll come fairly quickly with time and I just need to get used to driving normal cars again. <laughs> Although that said, the newest MX-5s have quite a high red line as well. I think it's about 7,500, 8,000 perhaps off the top of my head. Um, when they did the refresh in 2019, they bumped that up a little bit to give you a uh, in order to get a little bit more power and because they reckoned they could probably get that out of the engine at that point. I think they lightened the flywheel as well, which makes it a little bit revier and a little bit more playful. So hopefully I'll be able to get one that's at least a 2019 model when I do upgrade. But we'll see, we'll see how it goes. In the meantime, yeah, very happy with this car. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. It, it put, it's put me back in a sports car. It's got me that, it's right. It's put me back in the convertible. It's got me that soft top that, as you know, as you all know, I absolutely adore. And yeah, it's just generally much, much better. I'm, uh, yeah, and um, and it does that. <laughs> yeah, definitely a fan of that. <laughs> so I was worried after the RX-8 that I'd be um, disappointed by getting back in an MX-5 because it wouldn't have enough power. So this is just going to extend that and make it possibly make it worse because I've got used to the um, the extra power of this car as well. But you know, we'll see how it goes. I'll um, I, I think maybe the newer MX-5s will be enough to keep me happy because they do have. They've got a bit more power than the old, um, than my old Mark II did. We'll just have, we'll have to see how it goes. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and um, it's given you a bit of an insight into into the uh, new car and um, and what it can do, what I what I what I what's good and what's bad and what's not quite so good about it. As I say, overall, definitely very happy with it, and um, I'm going to hang on to it, and we'll see uh, at least until MX-5s come down come down in price. And knowing me, probably until it starts to break. So we'll. Um, we shall see over the next um, few years, I guess. I've got plenty of things I want to do with the car, and I'll be making some videos of those as I go along, so don't forget to check back, and don't forget to subscribe so you'll be notified when those happen, and maybe check out some of the other stuff on the channel. There's lots of, lots of videos on there. I've been at this for a while now, and there's a wide variety, and I'm sure you'll be able to find something you like. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.